Hey everybody, I'm Allison Freyberg and welcome to Lecture 13, Proving Ideas 1, CKOM and HDIK. What do these mean? We will find out, but we're going to focus on what it takes and to actually prove your ideas rather than simply introduce them. Let's have a go. Disclaimer before I even begin. All the photos in this deck are of ones I took in Trieste, Italy, and I'd like to say it relates to the content of what we're talking about, but it doesn't. I simply missed Italy and wanted to uh, and wanted to take this opportunity to remind you that we have study abroad programs, and I hope you you are able to explore this opportunity. You can always contact me and find out more about that. Okay, so which of these things have you thought when you're trying to prove your ideas in your writing? Wait, what? You want to know my opinion? Wait a minute, I thought I was supposed to just report on the research that's out there. You want to know what I think? I hear that a lot, and we need to talk about how you contribute insights to your research analyses. How about this one? Evidence is all I need to prove my ideas. Because that's what we told you, right? We said, what, how do you prove a claim? With evidence. Well, we're going to learn it's a little more complicated than that. How about this one? I'm not sure what counts as evidence. We're going to talk about that. And number four, how do I link evidence to claims? We will address all four of these thoughts, all four of these positions, all four of these habits over the course of the next two lectures, proving ideas one and proving ideas two. We'll introduce the first two techniques in this lecture, and then in part two, we'll do the expanded evidence to claims technique. Okay. So the techniques we're going to use to prove your point every time in this lecture are number one, the CKOM test, which means nothing right now, but hopefully it will in about 15 minutes. And what I call the how do I know test. And these are just ways of looking at your writing, ways of looking at your papers to try to identify where your ideas are and whether or not you've proven them how you substantiate your claims. This is the um, Miramara Castle in uh, just outside Trieste. Okay, here's the CKOM method. And I like to introduce it as a way of really keeping track of whose ideas are whose, which is also going to help you avoiding plagiarism, but it's also a way of getting kind of a global view of your paper. CK stands for common knowledge. So for this exercise, what you would do is label any idea in your paper that eight out of 10 people in your audience, remember we talked about that, the eight out of 10 people in your audience would already know. That's like common knowledge. Everything that people would just take for granted. If you label it an O, you're saying that's someone else's idea. That's another person's idea. And if you label a sentence an M, you're saying it's your idea. It's not you summarizing someone else's idea, but it's what you're bringing to the table, it's what you're bringing to the paper, your insights, your ideas. Now, what this exercise asks you to do is go through your entire paper, if it's an analytical paper, right? go through your entire paper and label each sentence. Is it common knowledge? Is it another person's idea? Is it my idea? And if you go through and do this, a couple of things are going to happen. All right, you may notice, for example, that the 
there is an oh another person's idea that you probably thought was yours or that you didn't cite so it's a good chance to just review who's talking okay now here's what tends to happen here's what i what i tend to see or have tended to see over the years let's say you do the inventory and i've just completely made these numbers up Okay, but let's say in paper A, there are 53 sentences that are common knowledge. There are eight sentences that consist of other people's ideas. And there are seven sentences that are mine, that are my insights as the writer. Is this a good analytical paper? No, it's pointless because almost everything is common knowledge. And if it's common knowledge, everybody already knows it. Why are you writing about it? There's no need. You're just telling people what they already know. Okay. Paper B, here's another example, another inventory. In this case, there's eight sentences of common knowledge. Okay, you get some common knowledge in there. 51 sentences are another person's idea or a summary of another person's idea. And nine sentences are mine as the writer, my ideas and my ideas only, what I'm bringing to the paper. Is this a good analytical paper? No, this is simply a summary of other people's ideas. Right? It's not an analysis. This is the writer who has gone out, done a lot of research, and then writes their analytical research paper by just summarizing all their sources. That's not an analysis. That's a summary. And if someone asks you to write a summary of the research, great, do that. But if someone is asking you to analyze a situation and you do paper B, you haven't done what you need to do because you're not contributing anything. You're not synthesizing that information. You're not finding ideas to bring to the situation. You're not revealing anything. You have simply curated other people's ideas. Okay, what about paper C? Paper C, oh, by the way, paper B generally looks like, let's say it's a 10 page paper. There's an intro with a bunch of common knowledge in it. Then there's eight and a half pages of summarizing other people's ideas. And then usually there's one last page where the writer just says, this is what I think. And there's no synthesis. There's no uh, conversation with those sources. It's simply a summary with your opinion at the end. Now that's not what we need because we have no idea what you're doing with those ideas that are yours, how they interact with the research. Paper C let's say has eight sentences that are common knowledge, eight sentences that are drawing on the research that are other people's idea, and 49 sentences, which are the writers. This is what the writer thinks. Is that good? No, that's simply a rant. That's the writer going on a rant and not paying attention to the conversations that have come before them, to the research that's out there in the field. Okay, so that's not helpful. Paper D is what you want to go for, right? And what do you notice? There's an analysis. Sure, you got a little bit of common knowledge. Of course you do. But look at this, it's almost like 50-50, 60-40 in terms of the balance between other people's ideas and the writer's ideas, the writer's insights. That's a good analysis. 
And I joke often that a good analysis is like a good date. And when you're on a good date, each person's talking about 50% of the time, right? Sure, naturally someone will talk a little bit more, but it's not gonna get completely out of balance. And that's exactly what happens in a good analysis. You are demonstrating understanding of the ideas and the research and the debates that have come before you, and you are finding a way to contribute to that conversation. Paper D is what you're striving for. And the CKOM method allows you to really do an inventory of your draft, of your paper, and figure out, is there enough of other people's ideas? Is there enough of my ideas? Is common knowledge minimized? It gives you a, set, a way to look at, a lens through which to read your paper. That's the CKOM method. CK, common knowledge, O, other person's idea, M, my idea. All right, let's go on to the next technique. And this is explaining how you arrived at your claim. This is the... Um, the main piazza in Trieste. It's actually the largest piazza on the Adriatic. Okay, the second technique is called the how do I know test. And I'll tell you right now, I think the biggest problem in analytical writing is a tendency to avoid substantiating claims. We'll toss a lot of claims out there, but we don't explain how we arrived at our claims. And the HDIK, the how do I know test, is a way of kind of provoking ourselves to explain how we arrived at our claim. And all you have to do is find the claims in your paper and ask, how do I know this? And if you don't see the answer to how I know this nearby, then you haven't explained the claim, right? First thing you gotta do is identify the claim and then go see if there's something nearby that explains how you arrived at that claim. Here's an example. Now remember a claim is something that reasonable people could disagree about. Let's look at this one. Emotional labor is part of many jobs today. That's probably a CK. Okay, that's kind of common knowledge. That's just a little throat clearing. In particular, the field of nursing involves much emotional labor. Okay, that's Seems kind of common knowledge. Now we get into the interesting stuff. Nurses must manage the emotions of not only their patients, but of their coworkers as well, especially the medical residents. Huh. Well, how do I know that? That's not obvious. Now, in the next sentence, do I explain how I know about this managing of medical residents? Here's the next sentence. Hawk's child would agree that emotional labor is part of a nurse's job. Um, no, well, that doesn't follow up the last sentence at all. So I'm not explaining how I know about the medical residents. And Quite frankly, how do I know that Hawk's child would agree with that? What have I said in the paragraph so far that explains how Hawk's child would agree with that? Let's see if the next sentence shows me what was in the Hawk's child text that made me believe that she would agree that emotional labor is part of a nurse's job. 
So what's the next sentence? She would recognize that the nurse performs this emotional labor for multiple stakeholders, and this would affect the nurse's ability to function well emotionally outside the healthcare environment. Wow. Well, this doesn't explain at all how Hawk's child showed me that emotional labor is part of a nurse's job. I'm not quoting Hawk's child. I'm not explaining how her ideas led me to this claim. I'm just saying, trust me, Hawk's child would say this. And when you're in the position of where you're basically telling your reader to trust you, you are no longer writing an analysis. You should just be out having coffee with a friend because that's when you say, trust me on this one. There's no trust in research analysis. You have to show it. So that's an interesting sentence that I just read. But how do I know that? That now I'm talking about outside the healthcare environment and a nurse's ability and, okay, let's look at the next sentence. Hawk's child would say that nurses would have a difficult time turning off the caretaker disposition outside of work. How do I know that? Again, I've just spent the last half of that paragraph saying Hawk's child would, Hawk's child would, Hawk's child would but I didn't tell you how I came to that decision. And you have to do that. But all I did was ask, how do I know? At the end of sentences that really asserted something. And all you have to do to substantiate your claim is answer that question. How do I know? If you do that, you'll substantiate your claims. And by the way, your papers will be much longer because I think one of the tendencies is just throw out a lot of claims and not explain how you got there. All right, so here's our recap. Whose idea? Distinguish between your idea and the ideas of others using the CKOM method. Get yourself a good balance of O's and M's. Find out what your tendencies are in your writing. And to substantiate, use the how do I know test. Either of these ideas, either of these techniques is a great experiment to do on your own writing. And it reveals to you where your unsubstantiated claims are, where your tendencies are in terms of summarizing, in terms of just going on and not engaging with other people's ideas, of relying on common knowledge. This helps you recognize tendencies in your own writing. And that is Proving Your Ideas Lecture 1. I'll see you for the next lecture.